by inflows from the, the Arctic, um, uh, from the Atlantic and the Pacific, with the important impacts on the regional atmosphere, sea ice, and ecosystems. While on the other end, the water mass trans transformation processes in the Arctic produce water masses that affect and contribute to the global overturning circulation. Um, and understanding these two-way interactions is critical for our ability to project the evolution of the Arctic Earth system in, in, in general. So today we will have uh, two presentations by very uh, distinguished scientists. Uh, the first speaker will be um, Igor Polyakov from the University of Alaska uh, Fairbanks, who is also affiliated with the International Arctic Research uh, Center. And he will talk about the status and trends of the Arctic Ocean circulation. So the presentation should normally be 15 minutes with some time for questions afterwards. And hopefully at the end of the presentations, we will have some time for some general discussion. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Igor. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> please remember to, uh, to mute yourself if you're not speaking. Do you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Okay, good. Looks great, thanks. Happy New Year, and thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. It's very limited in time, so it will be very sketchy, very brief, but I hope I will deliver a message about these big changes we currently observe in the Arctic Ocean. And my focus will be on Arctic Ocean circulation. First, I will touch Pan-Arctic changes. That will be sort of an introductory, introductory note. And then I will talk about consequences of changes of regional stratification. And I will talk about Atlantification. I will talk, uh, finish my presentation with some synthesis and pers perspectives. And so let's talk a little bit about Pan-Arctic changes. For this plot, I used the reanalysis uh, data and uh, this uh, reanalysis ORAS-5 uh, proves to me to be extremely helpful, extremely useful to deliver um, a lot of useful information about uh, Arctic Ocean circulation and its changes. So here in these two plots, you see anomalous upper ocean circulation in, within 30 upper meters of the water column separated by 15 years for 1992 to 2006 left panel and 2007 to 2021. And these are anomalies of current speed. Anomalies relative to mean 1975-2021. And I would like to stress big differences between the state of Arctic Ocean circulation based on this reanalysis. First of all, you see that the recent 15 years are associated with very strong increase of oceanic currents in the, in the central Arctic. That is shown by dominating red color. This is true for amplified the buffer gyre here, anticyclonic buffer gyre. This is also true with amplified currents in the Eastern Eurasian Basin along the slope. This is also associated with change of the position of transpolar drift, which was closer to the Lomonosov Ridge in recent 15 years compared with the previous 15 years. You see this as indicated by these purple arrows. You also see a very interesting feature of shift of the different impact of influx through Fram Strait and the Barents Sea. In, 2000, in 1992, 2006, the dominant inflow was through Fram Strait as indicated by this uh, red uh, branch of influx through Fram Strait, whereas in the last 15 years, the dominant branch was the Barents Sea branch. These are very important, very interesting findings, and uh, uh, I would like to emphasize them because they are important for the future discussion. Next slide shows repeated cross sections made along the certain lines. For example, this cascade of cross sections of water temperatures are associated with observations, annual observations along this line in Eurasian basin. And in this plot, I show four uh, positions for these repeated cross sections. 
Each uh, cross section here shows water temperature. So red color indicates very warm water, blue color indicates very cold water. And this is vertical uh, axis depth. This is a horizontal distance from the slope. And you see this cascade of uh, water temperature cross sections show a dramatic increase of water temperature in the interior from 2000. <laughs> to 2003 through 2007, 8, 9, where the temperature was at peak. And now you see the dec uh, slight decay of water temperature compared with the peak one, but still the water in the ocean interior is much warmer compared with the beginning of 2000s. What is also important to emphasize is that at the top of these cross sections, we see impact of surface warming. There was nothing like that in the early years because uh, according to our observations, this area was completely ice covered. So that's a big transformation in the Arctic Ocean when the seasonal ice zone moved from the shelf into the uh, deep ocean. It's very important to emphasize that together with the change in the water heat content in the ocean interior, there was a change in the halocline. In this plot, halocline is indicated by this warm or this cold uh, layer we, where the temperature rapidly goes from uh, high values to very low values at the surface. Salinity in this layer also decreases rap rapidly. And this uh, layer was very important. Halocline was very important in the past, provide, serving as a very strong barrier for the oceanic heat to penetrate through the halocline and reach the bottom of sea ice and ha having impact uh, on sea ice uh, formation. So this is that that will be basically the story of my major presentation part of the presentation where I will discuss uh, consequences of changes of original stratification in the Hulk line and associated uh, process which I call Atlantification. These changes in the Hulk line are clearly seen in this plot of uh, vertical profiles of temperature, salinity, and buoyancy frequency. These measurements are made at this spot, which is climatological spot of our observational program NABAS. And from these profiles of temperature, you see shoaling of the Atlantic water. Shoaling means that in time, the boundary of the Atl Atlantic water becomes closer, closer, and closer to the surface, uh, uh, making Atlantic water heat more available for mixing from the surface. But most important uh, for my discussion today is that at the same time, Halakline became weaker, 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 and weaker. Stratification in the Halakline was much less in recent years compared with the past. And this is clearly identified by these profiles of salinity, which define the profiles of density. You see that in time, the profiles of salinity become closer and closer to vertical. That means that the vertical gradient of density becomes weaker and weaker, making the hollow line, this barrier, um, weaker and weaker for mixing and propagation of uh, heat from the ocean interior to the bottom of sea ice. Weakening of the hollow line was identified as a process which is influenced by influx of denser water from the Barents Sea. That's why I call this process uh, Atlantification. We definitely see impact of advection of anomalous features from subarctic seas into the Arctic. And together with local changes, uh, climatological changes, this remote induced changes play a very important role in shaping the current state of Arctic Ocean, sea ice, and atmosphere. You may say these are just three profiles from one spot, and maybe the Arctic Ocean was not that uh, changed uh, uh, considering its stratification, but this is not true. We made an analysis using historical observations uh, from ships, ITPs, from all possible sources of information and build these pictures, picture of available potential energy. This particular plot shows 
compares uh, available potential energy for the recent years, 2006-2017, versus what was observed uh, more than a decade above. So these are anomalous picture of available potential energy. And available potential energy is calculated for the upper ocean, including surface mixed layer and hollock line for this plot. In physical interpretation of this plot is like that. Available potential energy, the level of available potential energy characterizes the ability of water to be mixed. Less energy means more ability of layers to be mixed, whereas increase of available potential energy identifies the case when it's much more difficult to mix water. So you see that the process of accumulation of fresh water in the Canadian basin was associated with increase of available potential energy. That means that the Canadian basin is now more difficult to mix uh, compared with the Eurasian basin, which was losing uh, available potential energy, become more accessible to uh, mixing. And this plot here uh, uh, confirms this uh, argument that the Canadian basin will became much more stratified in recent years compared to the past. This uh, changes in the Eurasian basin had dramatic consequences for the mixing. This is a segment, one year segment of a mooring record from many records we have. This map shows location of moorings where we have similar records and they basically show similar situation. And this plot, this panel shows the heat content within the upper 140 meters. meters. Heat content may be also interpreted as the mean temperature. And it's smooth to, to keep seasonal cycles for easy interpretation. So you see that at the beginning of the year, the system accumulates heat and this heat goes from the bottom of this panel from the ocean interior. This is Atlantic water heat. And without uh, and mixing from the surface, this heat is accumulated in the upper layer. Then winter comes, sea ice formation occurs and this sea ice formation cools the water and re, uh, uh, salt re release uh, during sea ice formation mixes the upper ocean. And you see during the winter, um, uh, there is a great deal of ventilation of the upper ocean. It's also important to emphasize that this mixing goes well beyond the surface mix layer. You see that I limited this plot by 140 meters where the signal is statistically significant, but actually it goes to 160, 170 meters. This is already the Atlantic water uh, it, by itself proper. Uh, so we definitely see that winter mixing uh, gets a lot of heat from the ocean interior. And this arrow here indicates the depth statistically significant depth of surface ventilation, whereas just 10 years ago, ventilation didn't go beyond 80 meters. This is fundamentally different state of the ocean. Then winter go uh, is gone and there is no ventilation from the surface and the system become, uh, start, starts gaining heat again. And this cycle is repeated in time. Also, it's important to emphasize that the surface mixing is driven here by uh, sea ice formation and cooling and uh, salt rejection in the water. But uh, you see that the mixing goes well beyond the, the surface mix layer. And this is already a different process, process of entrainment where the internal waste play a critically important role in mixing of the ocean. Here is a, a record a raw data. So you can see the um, not smooth, but raw data temperature within a, a mooring record. And this plot shows two years of records. White line here indicates the depth of the surface mix layer. And um, you can see that in winters, the mixing goes to 80 meters, but uh, the mixing uh, associated with entrainment goes much in much deeper uh, layers. Uh, 
We can calculate the heat release uh, due to this mixing in the system using these mooring records just by comparing the rate of uh, heat loss in winter. And by this approach, we can estimate the amount of heat released to the bottom of sea ice uh, or heat fluxes. And doing this, we came to numbers of 7, 11, even more watts per square meter. We, can, we could compare these numbers with observations derived from previous years, 2007, 8, and we definitely see that this heat, current heat flux due to weakening of stratification and release of Atlantic water heat to the bottom of sea ice much amplified. This amplification of heat flux explains up to 1840 centimeters of, of additional sea ice loss uh, due to this um, uh, upward, additional upward heat flux. This is a very big number. The uh, ocean becomes critically important in shaping the state of sea ice in winter and producing different uh, uh, um, state of sea ice before summer sea ice melt in this area of the Arctic Ocean. This is not just uh, the, the uh, the only change in the system. We definitely see that all components of the system in the Eurasian basin are changed dramatically. So these are the records of uh, ocean currents within the semidiurnal band. This is depth, this is time, and for each panel shows one year record from our mooring uh, this position, its position is indicated here the, by this red dot. And you see that uh, within this very important band, which incorpor incorporates tides and inertial oscillations, the currents in 2004 5 were pretty weak. The same is true for 2006 7, whereas uh, in later years there was a great increase of the intensity of currents in semidiurnal band. There was uh, an estimate of three, four fold increase since 2004. And at the same time, there was a strong increase of vertical shear of horizontal currents. This shear is indicated in this column. So you see a lot of blue colors in early years, meaning low shear, whereas there is a lot of shear in recent years. And our collaboration with modeling uh, community to told us, uh, informed us that this is basically due to very strong increase of baroclinic tides. Another process, very important process is increase of coupling between ocean, sea ice and atmosphere. Because of all these changes, we expect to see an increase of coupling between these three components of the, uh, of the uh, Arctic climate system. And uh, here are uh, three panels showing uh, different things, but I would like to concentrate your attention on the color, which indicates uh, the correlation between wind speed and vertical shear of horizontal cu currents in winter, upper panel in summer, middle panel, and in transition period. So red color indicates strong correlation, blue color indicates much lower correlations, even negative correlation. So you see that for all seasons, the correlation between wind speed and shear, the same is true for currents in the upper 50 meters is increasing in time, meaning that there is strong increase of coupling between atmosphere, ice, and the ocean in the eastern Eurasian basin. Based on these fi findings, we came to an uh, idea of um, uh, a feedback mechanism, which is more complex than just ice albedo feedback, but together with ice albedo, it uh, builds a very important, uh, we believe, very strong feedback mechanism, mechanism in the ocean ice atmosphere system. So let's go uh, through the seasons. Summer, we have ice albedo feedback when surface warming uh, uh, due to uh, weaker ice cover increases warming of the surface mi mixed layer and uh, that leads to faster ice decay. Uh, 
faster ice decay uh, is translated in winter to more sea ice formation. More sea ice formation means uh, more mm, colder water, more salt rejected into the water, more mixing. And that's uh, a component of mixing scheme I was talking about based on our mooring res results. So based on this uh, enhanced incre increase of loss of stratification, we expect uh, the stronger ventilation of the upper ocean and a stronger upper heat, which reduces uh, the rate of sea ice formation and next summer comes and they reduce sea ice CIS produces conditions for stronger surface warming and the stronger ice will be the feedback. So we can, can build this picture of much stronger uh, feedback mechanism we were together with ice albida, we see the work of ocean heat feedback component. These are not only changes in the system. We definitely see changes with the structure of the ocean in the Eurasian basin. The, uh, the structure of the ocean, the Arctic Ocean was famous in the world due to its very particular um, feature, step-like structure. And uh, this profile of temperature and salinity for uh, 2009 definitely shows steps uh, associated with double diffusion. And, Igor, uh, yes. sorry, sorry to interrupt. You're um, at the 20 minute mark. Um, uh, wondering if you could wrap up so that we can uh, have oh, some time so, for discussion. Okay, yeah. okay, Thank okay. You. So we have, a lot of evidences of uh, changes in the system. And let me jump to synthesis and perspectives. So I would like to show you this plot, which shows, which compares sea ice concentration for four years in 2000s versus to four years in 2010s, late years. And we see a difference in ice concentration in the Eastern Eurasian Basin. This is the beginning of the fall season, sea ice formation. And uh, what I was talking about was associated with late um, release of oceanic heat in later period of time. But what we see here is that this release of uh, of heat happens in the recent, uh, in more early period of time. And we just recovered a mooring from this location and definitely see the big changes in the system where the uh, mixing in the system starts uh, in much earlier in October, November, which may cause this observed uh, loss of sea ice concentration in the Eastern Eurasian Basin. So we definitely see the continuation of the story of Atlantic and changes in the Arctic Ocean. So let me skip these plots and jump to my conclusions that seasonally ice-free central Arctic uh, Ocean regions is a new reality. And this is not just amplification of regional variability we observed in the past, but uh, there are some emerging processes and phenomena which are new for the regions. So we are talking here about a really new Arctic. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks so much, Igor. Ex extremely interesting presentation. Um, in, in the interest of time, I propose that we move on to, uh, to Tom Haynes' presentation and uh, reserve the, the questions uh, for after that presentation and the discussion. Um, excellent. So Tom, um, Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the Johns Hopkins uh, University, and he will talk about the conceptual model of polar overturning circulations. Okay, can you see the screen, folks, and the cursor? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. So thank you, everybody. Um, Happy New Year. Thank you for the invitation. So I want to talk about conceptual model of polar overturning circulations, and I'm going to talk specifically about the Arctic. Oops, there we go. Um, now, we know that the Arctic receives warm fresh water from lower latitudes, and then interaction with the atmosphere creates the water masses that Igor has just been telling us about, in particular, sea ice and uh, polar water. But we don't know the water mass transformation processes that control that conversion of warm, salty water into polar water. 
And therefore, it's important to try and understand the constraints on the system from basic fundamental physical principles. And that's what I'm going to try and do today. So when I'm talking about the polar oceans, in fact, what I really mean, what I really have in mind is the beta ocean. In other words, the part of the ocean where there is um, a strong halocline and there's surface sea ice. So in today's climate, polar ocean and beta ocean are kind of synonymous, but you, you should distinguish at least conceptually that they might be different. And so the overarching question is this on the left, what becomes of the global overturning circulation at high latitudes? The focus is going to be on the Arctic, but a lot of what I'm going to say at least has qualitative relevance to the Southern Ocean as well. Okay, so let's look at the water mass structure um, for the waters exchanging between the Arctic Ocean and the Nordic Seas um, across Fram Strait and the Barents Sea opening. And you can see on the left hand side temperature and salinity. And then the contours are showing the speed of the current. So white means into the plain. So this is the uh, warm, salty Norwegian Atlantic inflow across the Barents Sea. This is the West Spitsbergen current. And then the outflow is on the western side, the polar water, which is at the freezing point and very fresh. And then there's a deeper branch of the East Greenland current, which is actually not all that dissimilar in temperature to the inflowing water. It's a little cooler and it's a little fresher. And so in the TS diagram, we see inflowing Atlantic water here and outflowing polar water. And then the deep part of the East Greenland current is what I've called overflow water here. So the system you can think of as receiving warm, salty water in the uh, Atlantic water inflow. There's heat loss to the atmosphere. The atmosphere deposits fresh water on the surface, either directly by precipitation or via runoff. And the system produces three different types of water mass. So one of those is the polar water. So it's at the freezing point at the surface, very fresh. Another one is the overflow water cooler, slightly fresher version of Atlantic water. And the third one is sea ice. The question is, what determines the relative proportions of those three water masses? Atlantic water in, these three different modes out. What controls how much overflow water, how much polar water? And so that's the, that's the question I'm going to try and tackle in this talk with this conceptual model. And I'm going to apply basic physical principles, in particular conservation of mass and salt and heat, plus a few other uh, conservation principles to try and constrain those water mass transformation processes. Now we have to be somewhat prescriptive in deciding how those processes can work. And so I'm guided by a few key papers here. And, and the first one is this paper by Argard et al from 1985, which emphasizes the role of the shelves. So on the shelves, you can have net sea ice formation. Sea ice is exported from the shelves by the winds into the deep Arctic. And by the process of sea ice formation, the water gets salty and brine is rejected, which makes the, and the water is at the freezing point, can convect all the way to the bottom, which makes a very dense saline, briny shelf water. And that can overflow into the deep ocean. And as it overflows, it mixes in, in trains the ambient waters. So you can see this entrainment process. Um, and in fact, it's in this particular example, it's going beneath the uh, picnic line in the upper Atlantic water layer. Okay, so this is a fundamental way in which um, extraction of heat from the Atlantic water can form sea ice when there's an export of sea ice from the shelf and also form this overflow water. And then the other paper which is particularly useful is this paper by Tor Eldovic and Jan Evan Nielsen from about 10 years ago, which was looking at the same kind of system, but in a, in a somewhat different way. They were thinking about the Greenland Scotland Ridge, Atlantic water inflow, formation of one branch, overflow water, um, thermohaline overturning cell, and then the other branch, the polar water, which is the sometimes called the, an, an estuarine circulation. Okay, so let's think about their model a little bit more, they have Atlantic water flowing in, air-sea interaction, polar water flows out at the surface, overflow water flows out um, at depth beneath the inflowing Atlantic water. And what and Eldovic and Nilsson do is they construct a volume budget and they construct a salt budget and they construct a heat budget. So QS and QT are the net air-sea fluxes of 
salt and heat and um, this is a this is a system that has these constraints that will conserve these different quantities now there are some deficiencies or issues with their model and in particular um, this system of equations isn't closed so for example if you specify the atlantic water inflow strength and its properties and you specify the air sea fluxes you can't determine uniquely what specifies the amount of polar water or the amount of overflow water coming out because you need to also specify their temperatures and salinities okay so the way that Eldovic and Nielsen got round is around that is they assumed I mean, reasonable values for polar water temperature salinity and the overflow water temperature and salinity um that's not that's undesirable um, the other thing is that they don't have any sea ice, so a key part of this process is missing um, formation of sea ice, and it's also process agnostic, it, it simply specifies a, a budget of these various different quantities, so I, I wanted to be a little bit more prescriptive in specifying processes that will convert Atlantic water into polar water and into overflow water and get around some of these uh, restrictions. Okay, so let's talk about the first process. The first process is Atlantic water to polar water transformation. Now, in, in my mind's eye, I, I'm thinking about the um, high Arctic, so I'm thinking about the beta ocean, um, so in the presence of sea ice where there's a, a polar water layer, the Atlantic water lay, uh, lies beneath that, um, there's air sea interaction and there's sea ice. And the, the principal mechanism to form polar water from Atlantic water is that the Atlantic water um, interacts with melts and then mixes with sea ice okay so the atlantic water is cooled it has to be cooled to the freezing point and it's freshened it's freshened because it's melting the sea ice and that will produce a surface buoyant layer uh, which is fresher at the freezing point and so that is formation of atlantic water and so in the ts space you're going from atlantic water down to the freezing line here into fresher salinities now in order for the polar water always to be um, less dense more buoyant than the Atlantic water in this process you can only travel in the TS diagram along this red arrow or to its left okay so what is this red arrow so I'm starting from some Atlantic water TS point up here and this red arrow is the tangent to the isopycnal that passes through that point okay so if I'm freshening more than I'm cooling, then I'm going to create a less dense, therefore more buoyant polar water. And you can see from the TS diagram in the Fram Strait, there's this very hard, sharp upper limit to the salinity of the polar water, which is a little more than 34.5 here. OK, so I'm claiming that that is because there's this tangent line from the Atlantic water. If you're going to make polar water from Atlantic water by mixing with um, sea ice, cooling and freshening you can only ever be to the left of this red line oops sorry okay so that that is one of the that is one of the key mechanisms now um i'm not going to show you many equations at all if you're interested in more details um bert rudels talked about this in a nice paper from 2010 it's in it's in this reference and there's a webinar which you can go to you can click this link and you can see me talking about this in more detail there too now, the second mechanism of Atlantic water conversion is the shelf interaction. And in fact, there's, there's more than one piece going on here. So let's start up on the right with this schematic. So we have the shelf water, and I have in mind this Argyle et al. view. Um, Atlantic water penetrates onto the shelf. It loses heat to the atmosphere. It maybe gains some fresh water, for example, from runoff. The water is reaches the freezing point, sea ice is formed. The sea ice is exported into the deep basin and ultimately into low latitudes. The water that's left behind on the shelf gets briny and therefore more dense, and eventually it overflows. As it overflows, it entrains ambient water. And the ambient water consists of a mix of the water masses that are hanging around near the shelf break, which are polar water and Atlantic water. Okay, so some of the Atlantic water gets up onto the shelf and then is modified by the shelf processes. Some of the Atlantic water gets entrained directly into the overflow without ever being exposed to the atmosphere on the shelf. OK, so let's look in TS space at how that works. Let's look at the data plot on the left to begin with. So we're starting here at, with Atlantic water. 
here's the polar water. What I'm saying is that there's another water mass, which is not on this diagram, which is shelf water. So that's at the freezing point and it's salty, it's saline. Okay, so here, for example, would be uh, where shelf water would exist. Now, the, the data are from Fram Strait and Barents Sea Opening, so there's no surprise that there's no shelf water, water mass of these characteristics uh, in those data. But anyway, here's this shelf water, water type, and it mixes as it overflows with um, the ambient water. So the ambient water is going to be along a mixing line between polar water and Atlantic water shelf water mixes with those and it forms this overflow water mass with these characteristics here so it's cooler and slightly fresher okay and then in, in a schematic ts space here's the shelf water it's cylinders you can slide backwards and forwards here's the atlantic water here's the polar water it has an upper limit on its salinity which i talked about a moment ago but it can be fresher than that there's a mixture of those two which form ambient water the overflow water is formed by a mixture of the shelf water and the ambient water. And that mixture is controlled by this Greek capital phi, which is the entrainment. So if entrainment, the fractional entrainment is large, then the overflow water properties are close to the ambient water properties. And most of the Atlantic water goes straight into overflow water rather than going onto the shelf and vice versa. Okay, so entrainment can slide this overflow water TS properties backwards and forwards along that dashed line. Okay, so now let, let me put these elements together for you and show you some results. So I'm skipping lots of details here. You can ask me if you have questions or look at the references. The main parameters that go into this model are the Atlantic water properties. So it's flux, it's temperature, and it's salinity. And then one specifies the total amount of heat lost from the ocean to the atmosphere and the total amount of fresh water exchanged as well. So it doesn't matter if that's coming from precipitation or runoff. Okay, there's some ancillary parameters which I'm not going to talk about. The model principles are you can serve mass, salt, and heat. You have a specification for this entrainment parameter, this capital phi. Okay, and that is a frictional geostrophic plume model with mixing at hydraulic jumps based on some work from um, uh, overflows by um, Molly, Molly O'Neill Barringer and Jim Price. We require the system to be statically stable. So in other words, if we have a, a polar water density which is greater than Atlantic water, that's not an allowable solution. And we want a realistic sense of circulation. In other words, Atlantic water flows in ice, polar water, and overflow water flow out. If the system is saying, oh, hang on, I need the polar water to change its direction, then that is also not a legitimate solution. So what, what comes out of the solution of this are the properties of the overflow water, its temperature, salinity, and its flux. The flux of the polar water, the temperature of the polar water is set at the freezing point, and the fractional entrainment rate. Okay, so let me show you some solutions. So this, this is a canonical solution that is in the moderately realistic parameter regime. <clears throat> and it shows on the top diagram, the fluxes, mass fluxes, okay? But it's, this, these, you can think of it as sphere drips. Here's Atlantic water, about five sphere drips flowing in in total. The system, um, it gains some fresh water from the atmosphere, it loses heat, it produces three water masses, sea ice, polar water, and overflow water. And this particular solution has about three times as much overflow water being produced as polar water. And that is moderately realistic. If you look at the fluxes across the Fram Strait, polar water is about a third as much as the East Greenland current. Okay, the vertical scale is stretched here, so it doesn't look like it's one third as much. Okay, and let's, let's skip the heat flux diagram for the moment. Here's the TS space. You have a very saline shelf water and you have a lot of entrainment. So the overflow water properties are close to the ambient water. So small amount of salty shelf water overflows entrains a large amount of ambient water to form overflow water, which is therefore relatively warm. Okay, now I'm gonna change the heat flux loss slightly. In fact, here I've increased the heat flux by about 20%. Okay, otherwise everything else is held fixed. Now this upper diagram, you might not have noticed, the upper diagram essentially stays the same. 
So you still have about three times as much overflow water coming out of the system as you have polar water, which is moderately realistic in round numbers. The heat fluxes are different. And more importantly, the TS properties of the overflow water are quite different. So now the overflow water is very cold and it's a bit fresher, it's near freezing. Okay, so the same flux, but now it's much colder and shelf water is now much fresher than it was before. So this is a case where there's very weak entrainment. Okay, the overflow water is close to the shelf water TS properties and the Atlantic water in this solution is primarily crossing onto the shelf interacting with the atmosphere then overflowing is a relatively um, not dense overflow and therefore undergoing little entrainment okay and all I did was change the heat flux by increasing it by about 20% I think the number was in this case so there's a trade-off between this Atlantic water being converted into overflow water via entrainment or Atlantic water being converted into overflow water via a pathway onto and off the shelf. There's a trade-off between entrainment and shelf salinity for everything else held fixed. Okay, so let's look at that trade-off. So here are the two solutions I just showed you. This is the one which has got low entrainment. This is one of the relatively high heat flux. I call it shelf dominated. Here's the one with, um, very high entrainment, very saline um, shelf water and a, a low, weak shelf circulation. Okay, and then there's theory which lines these two points up. So the two solutions canonically are an entrainment dominated solution where the Atlantic water gets converted into overflow water directly and there's a weak circulation on the shelf, but the shelf is very saline versus shelf dominated where the Atlantic water goes onto the shelf loses a lot of heat, gets cold, flows off, very little entrainment. So now let's look at the solution sensitivity to varying that heat flux more broadly. Okay, I've given you two canonical solutions so far. And those two, those two solutions are shown on this diagram by the two vertical lines. So here's the first one. This is the one which is moderately realistic with a warm overflow water. Here's the second one. This is the one which has got the same fluxes, but has got a very cold overflow water and the uh, heat loss is a bit higher. So now I've, I've allowed the Q to vary continuously in this range. Okay, and what you're looking at here are the various different solutions for the flux of polar water, the flux of overflow water, and the flux of sea ice. Okay, the system makes these three water masses okay so the two vertical lines have got more or less the same polar water and overflow water formation rates but they've got quite different ts characteristics okay now if i if i increase the heat flux even more so i increase it 20 percent to get to this dashed line then you eventually reach this point called salt crisis as you as you increase the heat loss even more the polar water gets shut off it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and eventually it reaches zero okay now it can't go negative so when it hits zero i call that salt crisis and the solution ends now in this particular case what's happening is the system cannot export enough salt anymore there's large heat loss to the atmosphere the outflowing water masses are fresher than the inflowing water mass and there's relatively little fresh water being added by the atmosphere. And so the system can't export the salt that's being imported from the Atlantic water. And therefore, it, this is where the solution ends. In other words, um, if you went beyond that point, the polar water would change its sense of direction, its flow. Now, if um, you start... Yep. I hate to interrupt you, but you yep. have the 20 minute mark. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, so if you start at the, uh, this one here and you decrease Q, then you reach this alternative thing called heat crisis. Okay, again, the polar water switches off. But this is now because the system can't lose the heat in the inflowing Atlantic water. The heat loss to the atmosphere is too weak. Okay, so this diagram shows some, some characteristic things. The overwater cell is robust. In other words, you can, you can always have an overflow water cell, but the polar water cell can collapse. Now, 
Q is one of a number of input parameters. So more generally, you can vary also the freshwater flux and then the inflow flux of the Atlanta water, its temperature it's in, and its salinity. It turns out that the dominant single parameter combination that controls the behavior is this sum of terms, okay? So the salinity of the inflowing water is irrelevant essentially, but you can compensate for changes in Q with a change in F or U or, or T. Okay, so let me conclude. So this is a novel two cell conceptual model of the polar MOC terminus, in particular, the presence of sea ice, okay? What it suggests is that the polar, flow, the polar water to overflow water ratio and the shelf circulation will vary strongly with this set of parameters. Okay, heat loss, freshwater flux, and then inflowing Atlantic water heat flow. The overflow, the presence of the overflow water cell is robust, but the polar water cell can collapse, either because this set of parameters is too high or too low in what I call a heat crisis because the system can't export enough heat or a salt crisis because it can't export enough salts anymore. Now, the one that matches the observations is relatively close to heat crisis. In other words, if the loss of heat to the atmosphere um, goes down or there is more runoff provided from the atmosphere to the water or the inflowing heat flux in the Atlantic water increases, the system will be pushed closer to the heat crisis and that will be uh, indicated by polar water cell collapse. And as you approach the heat crisis, these are the things that happen, at least in this simple model. Entrainment and shelf salinity are high. Shelf circulation is weak. The variability in the system is small and the sea ice does not disappear before the heat crisis occurs. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to say. Here are some resources for finding out more, including some GitHub repos and an interactive app where you can explore this. Thank you. Great, thanks, Tom. This is an extremely interesting um, session, and and uh, I'm really aware that both your presentation and Igor's was really a, a challenge to press that in in a limited amount of time. I mean, this, each of these presentations could easily have, have spent two hours or something like that. And I'm really grateful for you guys to provide these very complementary perspectives and, and very um, yeah from from really different observational and, and theoretical perspectives. Um, I understand that we have a little bit more time to uh, go over the hour, top of the hour. I uh, do realize that many people uh, may have to drop off at the top of the hour. Um, so let's open this up for discussion. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll start with John. John Tool. Thanks, thanks to both of you guys. Um, Tom, that was, uh, I would say that was very a brutal esque presentation. You, you I'm flat. said nothing about the flow of the Pacific water into the Arctic and out. You just add that as a pass through in this scheme? Essentially, yes. Yeah. So I did a, a master's student did a thesis with me recently where we looked at these, this basically the same three layers as you have. In the in on winds Asta simulation, um, we actually got a stronger conversion of Atlantic water to polar water than bottom water. Uh, but that is a that's a medium resolution model, and I, you know, I don't know what the exchange mechanisms in the model between the shelf and the deep ocean are, and uh, you know. I think that's critical. Those those transformations and entrainment are critical. And you know, a model that has 10 kilometer resolution, I don't know how those are represented. But so very interesting. Thanks. I think poorly is the answer. I mean, the, the overflow process, of course, is at really small scales and high frequencies. All right, Dimitri, do you have, um, do you want to ask your question to Igor? 
Yeah, actually, I'm trying to answer by writing, but I can answer without writing. Yeah, Dmitry, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to turn my camera on. <laughs> I have several displays. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you both for the presentations. It's, it was really interesting. Um, yeah, Igor, uh, uh, my question is um, about the negative feedback mechanism that could result from this increase. I smelled. Uh, I wonder if this can reduce the uh, vertical heat fluxes that you talked in your presentation and uh, return the system to the uh, pre authentication state. Uh, what, what, any comment about this? Any thoughts about this? How possible it is? Thank you. Basically, my um, presentation. Uh, I hope showed that this process of Atlantic water heat ventilation occurs in winter. This is a winter process with ventilation associated with sea ice formation. So both weaker stratification induced by advection of denser water from the Barents Sea plus uh, enhanced uh, sea ice formation uh, lead to ventilation of the upper ocean and imp that impacts sea ice formation. So this is not about sea ice melt because this is a winter process. This is about uh, decreasing of rate of sea ice formation in winter. So that preconditions ice for summer melt. So it doesn't create fresh water. It creates less. No, no. So I understand this, but in general, the increased sea ice melt would result in a higher fresh water content, right? So general, it will it will precondition it will, it will precondition lower heat flux in the winter. <laughs> but, but overall, there is less ice now in Eurasian basin than before. So if you even melt all ice and then freeze the same amount that would re result in uh, basically ba balance. But what I'm saying is that in winter, there is less ice formation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions for Igor or Tom? Lars. Hello. Yeah, maybe a simple question for Tom at the end here. So, I mean, one of the most simple things that goes on, I think, you know, we are losing the Arctic sea ice. This creates a larger portion of open water, and this increases the heat flux to the atmosphere, at least in the areas where we're losing that sea ice. So, so to me, I think, you know, a big question is whether this increased heat loss is, is driving a larger Atlantic inflow. And and in, in I mean, couldn't your model answer that question? Or I mean, somehow you keep the proportions of this polar water and the overflow water constant. I mean, they make so, but, but could you test a larger heat flux on the Atlantic water inflow volume? Um, sure. So so the relative amount of overflow water and polar water is not fixed in the two examples I showed it happened to be the same but in general it can vary so the Atlantic okay. water can be converted entirely into polar water or entirely into overflow water mm -hmm. that, that okay. emerges from the model and sure you can vary the Atlantic water volume flux the Atlantic water heat flux um, as you wish the heat crisis that I mentioned means loss of polar water so that at least in the context of this simple model is atlantification so you you no longer have sea ice and um a beta ocean then what tends to happen of course is that you get um thermal convection so you lose heat to the atmosphere mm -hmm. but the yeah. water is above the freezing point and it it um, convects to great depth like it does in the labrador sea that process is not in the model that i just described and I would love to include it, but I don't really know how to yet um, because I don't know what determines the fraction of Atlantic water that is converted to overflow water via that deep convection pathway versus the fraction of Atlantic water that goes into the Arctic and does this 
shelf interaction or sea ice interaction that I talked about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 you, I don't. I, I want that to emerge from the model. I don't want to specify that fraction. But that's just the cooling. It's. I mean, so what happens in the Barents Sea is that you have this Atlantic inflow. It's largely just cooled, and then it creates denser over. You know, by that that simple cooling just creates dense water, which doesn't really change the salinity, it just cools it, so. Yes, but so, but for example, if you think about what happens, the face of the water, which flows across the Greenland Scotland Ridge, like in the Norwegian current, part of it goes, recirculates south into the Greenland Sea and then ultimately into the subpolar North Atlantic to, yeah. and undergoes thermal convection. Part of it goes into the Arctic and doesn't, or at least in the, historically it didn't very much. I don't know what determines that split. Okay. But what fraction goes back south? What fraction carries on north? Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, if you, I would love to hear ideas if you have ideas about how to specify that. I'll think about it. <laughs> and I, I mean, if there's time, and one simple, I mean, very also very nice presentation by Igor, but you know, but the main cause of what you see up there, which is very convincing, is, is that just a stronger Atlantic inflow? Then would that explain so this, so this deep, this steepening of the salinity at depth, Igor? That's just that could be explained by just more Atlantic water, couldn't it? That's what you're saying. Yeah, our recent al analysis definitely shows that this signal, this stre strengthening, uh, weakening of the Ar Arctic holocline is due to uh, advection of what denser waters from the northern Barents Sea. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very both of you. Very interesting. Any other questions? Maybe just for me to follow up on, on Lars' question to Igor. Um, so are they, is it then clear then what causes that enhanced inflow? Is that a kind of a, a greater push from the from the south northward, or is there also maybe a, an, a pool component that could be maybe consistent with some of the stuff that uh, that Tom presented? Are you asking about this uh, differences in the Barents Sea opening inflow versus from straight inflow, or um, I can in general, I suppose the the enhanced inflow of Atlantic water into the Arctic? I think the strong role plays the atmospheric cyclonicity, anticyclonicity. That's what we are currently doing this analysis. And we definitely see that the current atmospheric regime pushes more water through the Barents Sea, as I showed in my one of the first slides, uh, then through the Fram Strait. And that makes very, very important changes in, in the Arctic. So I was showing that Atlantic water after 2007, 8 uh, became a little bit cooler. This is very consistent with more uh, important role of Barents Sea water entering the Arctic Ocean than from Strait. And there are many other uh, evidences li like, like that. So definitely atmospheric circulation plays a very important role in shaping uh, the influx of Atlantic water into the Arctic Ocean. And is the distinction then between uh, the inflow through the Fram Strait or the Barents Sea opening is that then uh, just due to the different ways that the ocean then interacts with the atmosphere in how strong yeah, it, it is inclu inclu including that it's not only just um, arctic uh, atmospheric circulation this is also uh, atmospheric circulation in the nordic seas which shapes anomalous state of what water circulation there and that contributes also to influx of atlantic water through from strait or versus for the Barents Sea opening. So this, this is a very coupled system. So we definitely see that the system, ice, ocean, atmosphere uh, is very coupled and you cannot just split one element from others and explain what's going on. That's, that's a good, really good insight. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Tom or Igor? <laughs> 
All right, if not, we're five minutes past the, past the hour. Um, then I'd, I'd like to conclude the session and by thanking Igor and Tom for their very interesting presentations, really state of the art on this, uh, on, on the thinking here. Um, uh, Meredith, do you want to have some final words for the close this off? Thank you all for joining. I will note that um, James Morrison has put another question in the chat and also um, want to, again, invite anyone who's interested in participating in IARPIC in a leadership position to consider being a co-lead for this team. Um, and I'm putting the link again in the chat. Excellent. All right, with that, we'll conclude. And I think uh, the physical oceanography team is uh, preparing our, our next meeting for, for March. So we're gonna skip, uh, skip February. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye.